Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Smite Comprehensive Guide to Osiris. A couple of things I want to note here. I am partied up with Cheese Please 26 and Phase Dio, if they ever see this high. But I this is another uh, episode of the Smite Comprehensive Guide to Osiris. This is a full solo lane match. The enemy team does not surrender. And I build incorrectly at the start because I assume that I'm going to be up against Hercules. All right, I, I am making that assumption here. Now, I build a little differently than I normally do with that understanding, and while at the end of the day it does work out, and I will explain why, it not only is that something I wanted to talk, to talk about extensively, but I also have a really great example here using my gameplay of how to counteract a mage as an auto-attacking solo laner. Now, this goes beyond Osiris. Osiris is just a particularly good example of this because he is a very strong auto-attacking solo laner. He's one of the strongest, in fact. Only really Bologna beats him in terms of auto-attacking efficiency, and uh, Erlang Shen gives him a run for his money. But in terms of auto-attacking solo laners, this is generally how you want to deal with mages in a lot of situations. It's a very textbook example of this. All right. Um, so what I'm going to initially do is just go to here because obviously this is where... Actually, we'll go one more because I'm you know, going to put down my ward here. Now, you'll notice that I actually, instead of going for my usual tier 2 teleport, the... Chalice of Health and the multi potions, right? And I skip over tier one item. I have the tier one shield here. Now, the reason why is, again, going back to what I said earlier, I was assuming Hercules was going to be my laning opponent here. So I'm very surprised when I see Anubis show up in lane. Now, the reason why I was going to build defense first is because in an Osiris versus Hercules fight, as long as I have Death's Toll, I'm going to out-sustain him, not in HP, he's going to match me in HP, generally speaking, but I'm going to outmatch him in terms of mana, because he doesn't have the ability to regenerate his mana, and his wave clear predominantly is a two-ability combo, right? So it's fairly mana-intensive for him to clear a wave efficiently, and given that I am Osiris, and uh, a Hercules opponent, would want to clear the wave as quickly as possible. So it wouldn't be too difficult for me to play it safe and clear the wave pretty safely and thereby out-sustain him. And as he went back, I would not necessarily need to go back and I could regenerate both my health and my mana using Death's Toll. So that's what I was going for with this. And of course, building up my protections earlier than normal would help me outlast the uh, Hercules in the long term. So it was more important for me in this particular case to not try to match his sustain, because I don't need to in this case. In this case, I just need to be able to survive his attacks. And of course, Hercules hits particularly hard in the early game due to his passive boosting his power, so he is quite the threat in the early game, even for Osiris here. So that's what my goal was with this particular start. This is something I do quite often with laning opponents that have a large amount of sustain. In fact, you'll uh, uh, not too long ago with the King Arthur solo lane gameplay, I was showing King Arthur against a Kamazot, where I had a bit of a different... I basically had the reverse line of reasoning, but, you know, you do have to adjust according to your expectations. I just happened to be wrong here. It works out due to some interesting choices that the Anubis has made, which we'll go on ahead and go to the 30 seconds here. This is actually, we'll go back 10 seconds here, right? So I've just cleared the mana buff. Nothing particularly unusual happens there, right? And then I waltz into lane and lo and behold, there's Anubis. Now, Anubis is approaching from this direction probably by force of habit because if Anubis approaches from this direction, he has access to my wave a little bit and most Anubis players regardless of the lane they're in, typically grab a Locust Breath. Now, the reason why is because Locust Breath has slightly higher flat damage than Grasp of the Dead, their, the Anubis's other regular damaging ability. However, unlike Grasp of the Dead, Locust Breath requires a very specific location with which they, you know, he actually can hit the whole wave, but you see here, he has Grasp of the Dead. Now, th some people might leap to the conclusion that that was a mistake by the Anubis or something like that. He accidentally grabbed Grasp of the Dead instead of Locust Breath, but that doesn't really compute because they're actually on 
far enough away keys where it's very difficult to misclick one for the other. He, if he was going to misclick, he'd be more likely to misclick onto the stun, which would be pr uh, honestly the worst case scenario. But what I suspect happened here is that Anubis understood that I was likely to be his laning opponent and grabbed Grasp of the Dead for the very specific reason that he could damage the wave from an extremely safe distance. Because if he did try to Locust Breath, he was probably concerned that I would attack him. And again, Osiris really wants to be fighting in wave in most cases. Now, generally speaking, Anubis players start with some lifesteal, which would balance this out and actually make Anubis more interested in fighting in wave as well. The fact that he's grabbed Grasp of the Dead here and he is running away, you can see he is beelining as far away from me as possible, indicates to me that he is not building lifesteal as his first item. I don't know what the hell he is building, but it's not lifesteal, because if it was lifesteal, he would have gone for the Locust Breath and basically dared me to fight him in wave, because he would have come out of that just as well, if not slightly better, than I would, right? And, quite frankly, he would have come out slightly better because I have the wrong second item here, okay? So he would have been in a better position. He doesn't know that at this point, obviously. He probably just, if he's checked uh, my build right now, he only just now became aware of this, frankly. But he would have probably come out of that little engagement not too shabbily. So the fact that he's done this indicates to me, as a solo lane player, that he is not building lifesteal so i have to figure out what the hell he is building but that's going to come when i have the time to do so but you can actually see me watch him because i'm trying to figure out what his actual plan here is because he is taking great pains now i just go on ahead and clear the wave and i miss a poke there i miss an opportunity to poke him there which is fine i go on to him and i poke him a little bit grab my one to slow him down a little bit get a couple more hits now the only real point of that was to try to do as much damage as possible i know he's not building lifesteal so he's not going to heal it back I just want to pressure him to kind of keep him away from the area, right? I want to get some pressure early on, and I want to be able to keep him under tower, right? Because that is what I'll want to do for a mage laning opponent. He's, you know, typically going to be able to clear better than me. He's already grabbed Locust Breath, obviously. Ares is kicking around. The Ares jungle, by the way, also is a bit of a surprise to me, but not by that much. But, uh... You know, I'm going to be able to out-sustain the Anubis here because probably, well, at least I assume I will. This winds up, my opinion changes a little bit in a bit when I check his build. But, you know, I'm going to have the mono regeneration in theory and he's not. So I'm going to be able to sustain my way through this. And again, he's backing off here because he doesn't want to fight me even though uh, he has Locust Breath. Because again, he doesn't have the lifesteal to actually fight me. He pokes me here because he... I'm far enough away from the wave where I'm not going to get that benefit, so I back off because I want to get this healing from these minions, and he's going to try to poke me here, right? He, Now, that's an interesting thing he does throughout this match. I'll talk while just trying to poke him. You can see I missed some poke opportunity there. I'm going on to him here because we have minion waves, and he got too close to my minions, right? And he continuously throughout the game just stuns me just for the purposes of delaying me, which... Whether or not you feel that matters is going to be a matter of personal opinion. I am not really slowed down by that much by this because he keeps it as a level 1 stun, so it's a very short duration for most of the time, so it's really more him blowing his mana. Now this is actually, hold on, I want to go back for this. This is really where he's very specifically, uh, where I find out what he's building here. Now he has the hourglass and he's what I'm assuming at this point is going to be warlock staff. I turn out to be correct here. And what this essentially means is that I'm actually not going to out sustain him in terms of mana like I originally thought, but I was correct about him not having lifesteal. So I actually will be out sustaining him in terms of HP, which is not something I normally expect against a laning opponent, especially an Anubis in the solo lane, okay? But that's what this indicates right here. All right, so I now know this, so I'm not going to be able to out-mana him, right? It's going to come down to HP. So with the, armed with this knowledge, I now know that at some point I'm going to have to fight this guy, right? And I'm going to be able to win that fight in time. What I need to do right now is poke him out. So, from this point forward, a majority of my abilities are not going to be aimed at minions, although I'll often try to get him and some minions, but 
um, the majority of my abilities in this particular case are going to be thrown at Anubis directly with the express intent of poking him, because what I want to do is poke him down to a low level of health, so that way if he gets a little aggressive with the wave, I can, you know, latch myself onto him and slap him down. That is my goal, and you will see most, again, I use uh, 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 Sickle there just to hit the uh, minion there, but most of my abilities are going to be used to damage the Anubis. Now I go back here so I can clear this scorpion and hit level 5 a little early, mostly to have it up in case I get ganked by Ares again. I won't really be using my ult that much in the laning phase because I am going to be trying to save it up to not get killed by Ares because obviously if Ares gets a chain on you, you're absolutely screwed, right? So I need my ult, which gives me CC immunity, to be able to get away from Ares if I need to. Now I back off, I realize he's not leveling up his Locust Breath by that damage, he is likely leveling up the Grasp of the Dead again to keep him from a, you know, engagement with me that he may not want. I go back for my mana buff, mostly for the Golden Experience. If you play Osiris extensively, you know that there's not a huge demand for mana from Osiris especially if you built Death's Toll earlier. Again, his abilities are fairly cheap in terms of mana cost, comparatively speaking, but I'm really here for primarily the Golden Experience. Pop on over here and clear the wave, and increase the Spirit Flail. Now, I increase the Spirit Flail in a lot of cases because, quite frankly, it's easier to hit um, than the Sickle is. And sure, you know, with practice and skill shots and everything, that's fairly easy, but I also want to be very specifically poking Anubis with his minions, ideally, so having the larger AoE ability level up here is going to make that a little easier, rather than just these random little pokes where I do very little damage to the minions, because Spirit Flail isn't leveled, right? So I'm, I'm, that is why, very specifically, I am leveling up Spirit Flail in this case, right? So... Again, busting out some attempts at poking. I miss. It's fine. I get the mana back really quick. I'm not really concerned about it. Bust out a nice um, tether. He gets out. That's fine. Throw out some more um, poke. No problem. Right? And he's now half dead, so that's fairly nice for me. Kill the minions. Again, very little competition. I don't know where Ares is, but I have my ult, so I'm not that worried about it. Keep on poking. Keep on clearing waves. Right? That's all I'm looking to do right now. Miss my sickle, it's fine. Go on ahead and, you know, poke him again. You can see me throwing out abilities just to damage him. Because, again, he's not building lifesteal. He should have built lifesteal, alright? Building stacks on Anubis is never as good as building lifesteal is. I don't know why he's building Warlock Staff. It makes no sense to me, but here we are. Right, so I'm going to steal his Scorpion at this particular point. Ba -ba -bum. There you go. And now he's seems to have backed, is my guess at this point, right? And here we are, watching him teleport back in. But, you know, I didn't see him at the wave, so my assumption was that he backed. He is now probably going back for his mana buff. It's the only reason at this point that I can imagine he would be going in for that, right? He's uh, probably at his blue. Now, I'm assuming that that means Ares is in the area, because I haven't seen Ares for a hot minute and probably, yeah, Ares is kicking around somewhere nearby, right? So I'm going to go on ahead and, you know, poke him out a little bit. Again, I have my ult, so if I get attacked by Ares, I can bail really quick. So I'm not, again, that concerned. Now Loki's coming over, which means he's concerned. Right, he's clearing the Scorpion, which is fine. Um, technically, it's his anyways. But, you know, um, at this point, I'm kind of worried about the possibility of Ares coming in. I'm more seriously worried because first Anubis went in for his blue buff. I was going to go for mine, but I realized it would take too long. Uh, and then Loki came over, so I'm kind of getting a little concerned. And Anubis, you know, he's trying to get some nice damage on me. He backs off, which indicates to me that Ares is not kicking around probably because he would be a bit more aggressive if Ares was kicking around. Throw some more poke on him. Go ahead and clear some waves. Now, I could, you might be wondering why I don't freeze the lane, or freeze the wave, it, either term is, they mean the same thing, it depends on who you ask, is what term they use. The reason why is because it's poor sportsmanship. Is it illegal? No, it is not illegal. But it is poor form, and I discourage people from trying to freeze the wave, it's very unsportsmanlike. Um, it's just rude. And... It's, it's just very disrespectful, so I discourage you from um, 
freezing the wave, it's it's very, very frowned upon, all right? And anybody who says that it's not that disrespectful probably does it, okay? For the very specific reason of disrespect. So just don't freeze the wave, just kind of a PSA there. It, it is very rude. Um, I c again, I could do so here. This would not be too difficult for me to pull off with Anubis at this particular point. He is appropriately very scared of me. I'm a level ahead of him. I have better 1v1 fighting. He's not got any lifesteal, so he has no HP sustain. I'm going to be able to outsus out sustain him there. So he's justifiably afraid of fighting me, and that is how I could, you know, freeze the wave. I'm just choosing not to do so. Now, this isn't that much better because I am essentially trying to push as many minions under tower as possible. I am trying to poke him out. I'm trying to bully him out of lane, basically. Um, but it still isn't as bad as freezing the wave, and that's kind of part of solo lane is, is trying to bully the enemy under tower anyways. It's kind of one of the end goals there. So, yeah, don't freeze the wave. It's rude. All right. I discourage that often. So, Loki's back over here, so once again I'm nervous, because if Loki is here, what's Ares doing? What the Ares doing? Uh, again, Anubis probably just cleared his blue buff, his would be up at around the same time as mine. So, again, I can fairly safely assume that Ares is somewhere in the area. I try to get some poke on him from under the tower. He's backing at this point, which is fine. The Loki gives me a heart attack by diving for this. And it's, it was a very good gank, I must confess. I am extremely impressed. I didn't think he was going to do as well with that. I, I knew he'd reach the Anubis. I just didn't think he'd be able to kill the Anubis so quickly that he could get out in um, such a you know clean way. The Loki is very good in this match, by the way. Uh, shout out to the Loki if he ever sees this. Excellent player. So I'm grabbing Shogun's Kusari, and at this particular point, I make a very interesting decision where I very specifically go for Pestilence. Now, you might be wondering why. I don't normally encourage the purchasing of Pestilence. Normally, I would grab Toxic Blade. The reason why very specifically, actually I can let this run for a little bit because nothing huge happens right now, and if it does, I'll just pause. But the reason why, right, is I was, why I was originally going for Pestilence is Anubis would be healing, but then I remembered, you know, Anubis doesn't have healing. I'm just so used to Anubis having lifesteal that my first instinct was to grab Pestilence. Now, Anubis's lifesteal is very specifically, or Anubis's healing is very specifically tied to damage, so what I'm doing here is I'm temporarily grabbing Oni Hunter's Garb, right, and I'm doing this for the damage mitigation, it combos very well with Osiris's passive, but I need more magic protections than normal, because in this particular instance, the enemy solo lane and the enemy jungle are both magic damage sources, and they also still have Atlas, who appears to be, I'm pretty sure, is their ADC, I'm pretty sure Atlas is playing as ADC, because I'm pretty sure Hercules is... Well, I can tell you actually, uh, at, by the end of the match, that this is actually the case, but at the time, I only believed that the Atlas was the ADC, because I'd been seeing Ishtar in the mid lane a lot, so I assumed she was the mid laner. The point here is that there is an abnormally large amount of magic damage on the enemy team. This is actually an unusual case of a reversal of the usual rules of a team comp. Normally, a team comp has three sources of at least decent physical damage, Solo laners usually build less, but they still have at least some damage to offer, and then you have the ADC, which is usually a hunter, which is physical, and then you have the jungler, which is usually a physical assassin. In this particular case, we've got a magic jungler, a magic solo, and a magic ADC, which means a lot of the damage that I'll be taking is going to be magic damage, not physical. In fact, the only genuine physical threat on the board is Ishtar, so I'll still need some physical protections, but unlike the usual, which would be three physical, two magic, it's the reverse here, so I'll need much more magic protections. Now, the reason why I didn't go in for Pestilence at this time I decided on Oni Hunter's Garb instead was very specifically because I'm not 100% sure that Anubis is even going to be building enough lifesteal. He might not even be, you know, caught up enough in levels for that to matter, and the only other person at this point who is going to be self-healing at this point is Hercules. So I don't necessarily want to commit to a Pestilence if I'm not going to wind up needing it. So for the short term, I'm running Oni Hunter's Garb, because at the very least, the damage mitigation will help me, and I need the magic protections anyways, because of the unusual composition of the enemy team. Again, normally I wouldn't bust out 
Oni Hunter's Garb in addition to Shogun's Kusari, but in this particular instance, because of the uh, damage output that I expect from their magic damage sources, it's better for me to be building more magic protections here. Right? So that's my plan here. That is very specifically why I'm building this way. And again, I'm not too concerned about the Anubis at this point healing because I am ahead of him. I've been keeping him under tower pretty consistently. So I'm not really that concerned. I ult in on him because very specifically Ares is dead, so I'm free to use my ult. That is the only reason I ulted there. All right. I wanted to surprise the Anubis. I wanted to force the, the Anubis away, and the Ares was dead. Now, I do take a small risk here. Obviously, Ares is going to come back, and I'm without my ult for 50 seconds. But in terms of Osiris's ult, that's only a 75-second cooldown, and I have 10% reduction. That's, so that's 7.5 off, so it's only like a... 60 odd I think it's 67 and a half seconds of cooldown but either way I'm not too concerned because what Ares is going to want to do when he returns to uh, the field is he's going to want to clear out his jungle so I've probably got some time unless he does the unusual thing and just absolutely rushes me all right it's possible I've seen it done, I've been a victim to that before but it's not very common so I'm fairly comfortable using my ult there all right and once again, I'm just, you know, poking out the Anubis, constantly trying to get that damage on him, constantly trying to keep him under tower, because that's really how you need to be dealing with mages a lot of time. If you can get that early fight win, which I did on that first wave, right, he had to go back because he wasn't able to clear the wave as fast as I was. If you can clear that first wave faster, you can dominate the lane a lot like this with most mage opponents. There are a couple of exceptions, uh, depending on the matchup. I'm not going to get hyper-specific on that because it is very heavily dependent on the matchup there. I tried to intimidate him there and I failed. He didn't fall for it. Um, but that's generally how you want to handle mages. You want to win that first wave clear and then from there try to poke them and bully them under their tower. Right, that is the goal. Now I'm attacking the tower very specifically and I talk about taking the tower a decent bit and how important it is to try to time this. Now in this particular instance... I'm going to have a bit more of an impact on team fights than Anubis will, right? Anubis does not have lifesteal. He will die very quickly because at this point, his only real completed item at this point is probably Warlock Staff and maybe one other item, which I'll need to check soon that I, you know, at this particular point, I'm thinking about that. But at this particular point in time, I'm going to have a much stronger impact on team fights than he will. So I want to do some heavy damage to the tower. I'd like to get the tower as quickly as possible. I would like to scoot out of the lane a little bit earlier than maybe I normally would because I am very much dominating this lane, and while I could get a lot of free farm here, I could also help my team out. Now, in this particular point in time, I was getting concerned because we used to have a much bigger lead. They're starting to catch up. They've doubled their kills in a fairly short amount of time, right? And that's actually me checking to see if he's finally built lifesteal, and I actually want... I was checking a couple of things, but primarily it was his lifesteal. But there's a couple of things that I was paying attention to here. Now, first off, he does finally have his lifesteal. He did go for Warlock's staff, which he never should have gone for in the first place, in my opinion, but here we are. You know, we have the Atlas, which is, of course, I am partially incorrect, right? It is actually an interesting reversal here. Uh, they're actually doing what uh, I realize at this point, by the way, what they're doing is what is known as the man lane. I've referenced this before, but what the man lane is in terms of duo lane is where you take a duo lane and you put in two tanks. Most warriors, pretty much any guardian works in that role. A couple of choice assassins also can do this. But they just go full tank and they just try to use the early game flat damage advantage that they have. Hercules is particularly a smart choice for this. And try to just absolutely dominate in that lane using defense rather than damage. So that's what they're doing here. So I was incorrect on my initial assumption, right? I was assuming at this point that the Atlas was, in fact, going to be building as an ADC and Hercules was the support. With this in mind, I'm still looking at a unusually large amount of damage. Again, we are still talking about a, at this point, full damage Anubis and a full damage Ares as the jungler. So I'm still taking a good bit of damage, but now at this particular point, I am thinking, well, maybe I'll sell my Oni Hunter's Garb for possibly a double protection item. I'm still at this point not sure what I'm, how I'm going to react to this, but this is not the news that I was expecting to see on the enemy team, all right? 
again, my initial assumption was Atlas was an ADC, something I have seen before, and we'll talk about that one day in a separate video, but it's not my favorite thing. But that was what my original expectation was, and it turned out to not be true, so... Uh, I, I am thinking about how I'm going to have to adjust for this incorrect assumption I had while I continue poking out. It's not like I'm in any particular hurry here, right? This does actually adjust slightly for a brief period of time my thought process on whether or not I want to clear out this tower. Now it's looking even more important for me to clear this, actually, because at this particular point... Uh, I now know that a comeback for the enemy team is less likely, and I say it's more important for me to take this tower because if I can then force this Anubis to rotate, then he levels up slower, right? Now they try to bust out everything I ult away. This is why I saved up my ult, right? But basically, what I'm hoping to do is take Anubis's tower and then thereby force him to rotate. Because if he's forced to rotate, this means he's not in lane farming. And if he's not in lane farming, he is not going to be able to increase in levels. So by keeping him down, and he's at this point one of their very few sources of consistent damage because the enemy team decided to go with a man lane, then this means, and I get into a little bit of trouble here, this means that essentially I'll, you know, be really key for my team now the loki pops in he you know does some damage i basically get poked out a little bit here but it's not really that big of a deal loki's trying to get some poke here he loki leaves i'm backing up here because at this point i'm gonna go grab an item now i am very specifically and this is something i will be building very specifically is i'm thinking right now do i want pestilence yes i do i go with pestilence now i go with pestilence because anubis is building lifesteal i noticed the Ares is building lifesteal as well and we've got hercules building lifesteal again normally i would build toxic blade here but given the sheer amounts of magic damage i'm still kind of expecting to take pestilence was the smarter choice in this particular instance right and additionally, what I'm also going to be doing is increasing to the Berserker's Shield, and I'll be going back, you know, pretty soon. I grab the Ankh, right? And I thought about increasing my Teleport. I was going to, but I felt that the Gladiator's Shield was going to be more important for me, honestly. Again, I will be looking to rotate, and between uh, better Teleport or Physical Protections to help me against Ishtar, the Physical Protections won out, right? it's a bit more important. Again, I also built Pestilence due to needing more magic protections than normal, and also a strong desire to lower healing. Because yes, I do have my ult, but I want to be primarily saving my ult for Hercules, for when Hercules' self-heal gets painy. So I won't necessarily be trying to use that very specifically. Also, it's also my only way of getting out of Ares' um, Ult, so I don't want to rely on my ult as anti-healing, I want to use it as either a way to deal with Hercules if he's the last man standing on the enemy team, or to get away from an Ares ult if I really need to, because both of these are pretty serious threats. So I'm building some decent anti-healing because, very specifically, I don't intend to use my ult for anti-healing. Okay? And that does make a difference. If it was just Hercules and he was the only one healing on the enemy team... I could get away with just my ult. Now, the Apollo is over here. You might think that this is a wild move for the Apollo, but I'm going to be really honest here. With Apollo's global ult, he obviously just recently used it. But with Apollo's global ult, this really isn't as big of a deal as you would think. Apollo is one of probably... I, I'll actually go out and say that he's one of two hunters that I can think of off the top of my head that is totally fine with rotating like this. The other one is Jing Wei for kind of similar reasons. She doesn't have quite the reach as Apollo's ult for fairly obvious reasons, but she can, in fact, cover a lot of ground very quickly simply by backing and leaving the fountain, so she can achieve a sort of half effect of this. So that's why Apollo is over here. Now, I know that Apollo is over here for the gank. Here he comes, right? So I'm going to go on ahead and commit to this. I ult very specifically for that, right? I am putting myself at some risk here of getting ganked by Ares, but I want this tower. Again, I am trying to force the Anubis to rotate. I am trying to force the Anubis to not have access to his easy farm by forcing him to rotate. It's a very specific plan, so now I've taken this tower. I'm going to take this wave to put the pressure on Anubis to make a decision. Here's Ares. I gotta get out of here because he's absolutely slapping me down. And then here comes Atlas. Now, I was going to be able to get away from Ares, but I'm not likely to make it out of this scenario. Right, he ults me, which is a bit extreme, but understandable. And I'm just trying to get away with uh, 
the Ganesh coming in here and trying his best to save me. That shell absolutely kept me from dying to the Atlas ult. And then I'm just trying to escape. Now, I originally was going to go for the Tier 2 tower, but I decided to go for the Tier 1 because, quite frankly, I was expecting him to expect the Tier 2. He wound up expecting the Tier 1, so it was a mistake. He dives for me. Ganesh keeps him off. I dodge his ability. This is fine. Right, he comes back in for round 2 because he's apparently insane. Uh, keep in mind that he's building no damage, and I am aware of the fact, again, that he has no damage, that he was part of a man lane, so I jump on him for some damage, he dies to the tower, shout out to the Ganesh for keeping me alive for that, Ishtar is over there as well, I'm afraid that Ares is going to, you know, blink on me, which is, you could see the Ganesh also had the same realization, because you can actually see this is a great, it's not often that I get to see other people's uh, trains of thought, right, so we get um this very aggressive Atlas killed, and then, you know, Ares sort of feigns interest in me here, and then the the instant turnaround by this Ganesh, who clearly was watching the minimap at the time, the instant turnaround by this legend, to make sure that I don't get blinked on by this Ares and killed, absolutely amazing awareness by this Ganesh, instantly reacted, instantly made sure that the Ares knew that that was not going to be happening and the Ares backs off appropriately, absolutely great awareness by this Ganesh, just wanted to shout that out really quick, that that was absolutely fantastic, okay, and of course what I'm going to be wanting to do is trying to get back as quick as possible, I am going to grab the persistent teleport at this point, very specifically because at this particular junction, um, you know, I've cleared the Anubis's tower, the enemy team is visiting my lane now, so I need to be more mobile, I need to be able to teleport back and forth. Now my next item, my fifth item, I've now become aware of the fact that the man lane exists, and I just want to be able to deal with the Ishtar very specifically, so what I'm going for here is very specifically the Midgardian male. Could I have used, say for instance, um, Witchblade? I could have, yes. Uh, the primary issue, though, is that Ishtar is really the only person who will be... that would really be strongly affected by Witchblade. She's the only one on their team using auto-attacks other than Atlas, who, to some extent, does use auto-attacks. I'm, um... I'm cracking some, uh... jokes with the boys. I believe, you know... Uh, we all have a pretty similar sense of humor, but I'm just, you know, cracking jokes over here, but I come over here because I want to make sure that while I'm uh, out of this, uh, uh, by the way, I'm not partied with this Loki, um, but <laughs> I clear that way very specifically because while I'm leaving lane, because that is going to be my next move here, I don't want his wave to be pushing down. Now, I shouldn't have ulted there. I'm going to be really honest. I ulted there in a moment of hyper-aggression. I should not have. I should not have ulted there. That was a mistake. Again, my ult is my primary way of getting out of situations. I was going to go help the uh, Loki, but he doesn't need it. So off I go to help them in left lane, because it looks like they might need it. They're having a bit of a fight over there for the purple. Um, and here's, of course, Ares, who is pretty spooky for Thoth. Now, I'm assuming, again, that Ares is not coming in here alone. But, you know, here's Hercules to prove this. And then the Hercules is here, and I'm assuming the Hercules is going to be followed by some friends. Uh, he doesn't get followed by friends. I don't know if he was expecting friends or not. I don't know. I don't know if he was just trying to save the Ares, and Ares didn't make it. Here's Atlas a little late to the party, which is fine. We're going to be taking this tower here. Ganesh gets a great ult off on Atlas, and he uses that ult to reduce Atlas's protections to give us a little bit of, of a better time trying to kill him. He does make it out. Uh... Anubis ults, I ult him in response, I ult him in response primarily to mitigate his healing, because at this point he is healing, he just ulted, I wanted to make sure he wasn't going to heal anymore, right, here is Ishtar doing some pretty decent damage to me, in fact, I'm pretty sure she's going to kill me here, but I just engage, and I'm wondering, should I stay and commit hard to save the Thoth, you know, I'm, I'm trying to slow him down, uh, Thoth gets away, so I'm like, alright, I'm just going to try to to get out of here. I see the Apollo coming in, he messages me, I go on ahead and I turn around and I attack when he lands, and I'm just trying to get the Ishtar killed here. I unfortunately wandered too far away to get the stun, but he doesn't need it. We clean them up. 
which is a miracle for me because I was on the verge of death. Here's Ares to try to kill me, and then this absolute amazing kill. Now, keep in mind, this is, I actually want to emphasize this. I am partied with Cheese Police, who is an absolute legend of an ADC. Now, I want you to be very keenly aware of how incredible this is, right? I get attacked by the Ares, and the Ares is, you can see, already near death when he uses this. Just, this is just from Cheese Police shooting him the instant he blinked on me. This wasn't, there was zero hesitation, zero doubt. This saves my life, because if Arius had finished this ult, I 100% was going to die, all right? Because, remember, he's their jungler, and he is building damage here, okay? Very, very specifically. I am screwed if Ares gets this ult off, and I actually assume I am, but he kills Ares that quickly, all right? Now, it does help that he is five levels higher, right? And I'll talk about why we're so far ahead at the end of the match. There are specific reasons for this, but absolutely a fantastic kill by the by Cheese Police, the Apollo. That was, and even I'm like, that was an amazing kill. Absolutely fantastic kill. And the Thoth points out that they're getting steamrolled here at this point, um, which is a rather crude way of putting it, but they're not doing well, to be sure. They almost made a comeback in the laning phase, but right now we're discussing whether or not Loki wants Mage Eyes. He does ultimately purchase it, by the way, I believe, if my memory serves me, but there are reasons why they're having a hard time. This is actually, it's not the Anubis, by the way. The Anubis, the Anubis makes some building mistakes, but Anubis himself, if built correctly, does play very well in the role, as I'm sure solo main Anubises will tell you. But at this particular point, we're kind of going to be looking at some kind of uh, jungle boss at this point, whether it's the Fire Giant or the Gold Fury. I I'm personally leaning towards Fire Giant because at this particular point, we're far enough ahead where one good Fire Giant could be a nice push into victory, right? And... You know, here's Anubis over here, so Anubis was over here, and you can actually see, this is actually an interesting clue for me, because you can see there's somebody, I think it was Atlas right here, then we have Hercules over here, so they have a person in each lane when Anubis shows up here, so I know that they're not grouping up, right, which is not a great thing for them. Um, they really should be grouped up at this point, because they are behind, and because they're not grouped up. Now, keep in mind, we have Apollo with a global ult, so any team fight that any one of us on our team cares to start, Apollo can be there pretty quick. He's got his ult up, and even if they don't know his ult is up, they should be assuming that, right? We start a fight in the left. Well, I say we. Ganesh probably started this. Um, I'm not really sure who did. Cheese Please slaps down Atlas. Uh, Thoth slaps down... Uh, phase Dio, the other person I'm partied with, slaps down Ishtar. It's a lovely time. They won that fight, and that was just because of our level advantage at this particular point. They're chasing down Hercules. Now, this is a mistake for them to be chasing down Hercules. Hercules is clearly being a distraction. I go on ahead and attack middle lane. I told them this because they don't need me to be attacking the Hercules. They don't need me to be attacking the Ares. We're really far ahead as a team at this point, so I'm just going to go on ahead and take this tower because we should be getting something for this team fight. If I were to follow on the Hercules or the Ares fight, I would not be getting anything. We would get nothing for winning the team fight. We, it would be thrown away, right? So I take that tower. Anubis attacks me. I'm not sure why because he immediately bails, and... I'm just looking, I'm not looking for an engagement here. I took the tower. I want right tower or fire giant at this point. Again, I'm leaning more towards fire giant. So I'm trying to disengage. The Ganesh feels the same way, right? I make the call for the tower because Apollo is right here, right? That is the only reason I called this over fire giant. Here come the minions and off we go to the races, right? So the enemy is, you know, trying to interrupt, which is fine because this gives us a good opportunity to clean them up again. Uh, because they are down two people right now. They have two people dead. The Atlas does almost save the Anubis here. Phase Dio clearly steals my kill there. No, jokes. <laughs> it didn't really matter. I do make the joke here, though. But, you know, the enemy team has um, respawned at this point. I don't like the odds of us taking this Phoenix, so I'm just trying to, you know, get people out at this point. Ganesh dies here. He's our main front line. I, I don't want to stay in this fight, so I'm trying to, uh... 
get people out both bales, which is good. That is the correct choice here, especially since he's almost out of mana. Cheese Police is killing Ishtar. I'm just trying to get him out at this point. And then, you know, the Atlas is almost dead, so I'm going to lock him down and try to get him killed. Phase Dio does pick that up, which is good, because if I stayed there any longer, I was going to die earlier, right? I do die, but at least the Atlas went with me. You know, it's fine. I say worth here because it actually was. We got the Phoenix, which is really big news. Um, I'm going for the Chin Size at this point. Now, I'm going for Chin Size because they are a very tanky team comp. They have Hercules. They have uh, Atlas, obviously, both building uh, tank, right? But beyond that, again, remember that Anubis has a slight increase in his protections whenever he deals damage with his abilities. It goes up by 21. So he is a little tankier than the average mage, and of course, the um, bolster defense's aura of Ares with his second ability, that also increases protections. My buddy Cheese Police 26 throws out a joke surrender, and we actually have a conversation after the match that we were all tempted to accept this, but we, we resist temptation. We're funny guys. Anyways, back to the point, uh, besides our hilarity, at this particular point in time, what I'm looking to do is, again, set up for that fire giant. We took the tower, we took the right phoenix, that's going to keep them busy, because one of them is very likely to want to stay in right lane, so even if they do make an attempt at fire giant, it's not as likely that all five are going to come along and make the attempt, but we are absolutely slapping them here in mid at this particular point, we might even be able to, is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm thinking at this point, we might be able to push down and take Titan without Fire Giant. Very possible at this point. In fact, once they take out the Hercules, this is basically assured because the Ishtar was already, you know, a little bit behind. I call attacking the Middle Phoenix just to make sure that we're not, you know, thinking about the Fire Giant. And we're just, you know, taking out the Phoenix, the... Apollo in a little oh, cheese police in a moment of hilarity is zoning out the Ishtar, which is not his job, but he does successfully kill her. I ult the Titan because at this point only Ares is coming up, and yeah, he can ult me, but honestly, at this point, what is that going to do? We have a huge opportunity here to take out the Titan here, and we are absolutely 100% going to smack this thing down, and it is, you know, at this point just a matter of not dying unnecessarily to anything, right? Anubis makes a valid attempt at ulting. Not a bad attempt. It was a... I can understand his reasoning there, but it ultimately isn't going to matter at this point. We're too far ahead. And while we do unfortunately lose Ganesh, we, uh... We do take the Titan. We all mention how that was kind of a gross win, and, um... I want to talk about builds, because... The reason that they fell so far behind was due to a combination... Once again, as usual, it is a combination of smaller factors, okay? A huge series of little mistakes by the enemy team. Now, I don't know all the details, obviously. Um, I only know what was told to me after the fact and what this screen here tells me. But I want to take this piece by piece. Alright, first off, I'm going to deal... I'm going to go from left to right. I'm going to talk about my lane last. But I want to very specifically start with the man lane. Because this might be an unfamiliar concept to a lot of you watching and or listening. But for a couple of years now, and I think it was season 6, man lanes were a really big thing. Season 5 or season 6. And the man lane was, like I said, either two warriors, two guardians, or some combination of the two being in duo lane rather than having a hunter and a regular support. Again, the idea here is to build really tanky and then just, through sheer tankiness, bully your way through to uh, dominating the lane. Now, the reason this didn't ultimately work in this instance is a couple of very specific reasons. First, the Apollo Cheese Police 26 went for Death's Toll as his starter item. This is actually fairly important because the downside of most man lanes, again, Hercules is kind of an exception here, but most man lanes have a really hard time dealing damage safely. I mentioned earlier that Hercules has to hit a two ability combo in order to effectively clear the wave, and Atlas, of course, is fairly mana intensive himself because each one of those pulses costs a minimum of 10 mana. I can't remember if it goes up when um, 
he levels that ability up, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it costs a decent amount of mana for Atlas to clear as well, so while they would be able to clear a couple of lanes very effectively, again, due to their tankiness, it would be very mana intensive, and this is in fact the reason why you can see the Ares built Breastplate of Valor. Now, the Hercules claimed that it was built for the memes, right? And to some extent, that is true. This is not something you would normally build in that role, but this is a man lane, so he is going to want to build a protection item to reinforce the, you know, high defense strategy inherent in the man lane. And the Breastplate of Valor is going to give him cooldowns, it's going to give him MP5, not much, it's only 10 MP5, but it's still MP5, and at the end of the day, it is going to help him maintain the mana levels he needs to efficiently farm those waves, alright? It might have been a meme pick, but it was an intelligent meme pick. The Atlas, of course, went with the standardized um, Gauntlet of Thieves. Now, he did originally have, uh, if you remember from earlier in the video, he did originally have Sentinel's Gift. He sold that to get, I'm going to assume, Gem of Isolation there, um, which at that point it was too late anyways, but it doesn't really make a huge difference. Um, but that's, you know, totally fine. But at this particular point in time, you know, they were having mana troubles because of the nature of how mana intensive their wave clear is. And here's Cheese Police with Death's Toll and having one good ability to clear the wave with very effectively, rather than Hercules's two or Atlas's relatively mana draining pulse compared to the relatively low mana cost, again comparatively, to that with the Apollo ability there, and furthermore, we also had Ganesh, who, once he got his silence, which I'm assuming he picked up at level 2 or 3, they usually do, it was able to interrupt a lot of what Atlas and Hercules would normally be able to do. For example, if Hercules successfully pulled Cheese Police towards him, then all Ganesh would have to do to prevent the combo from being completed is just to silence the Hercules until Cheese Police could get out of there. Right. Now, again, I don't know 100% of the details of what specifically went down there, but these are definitely contributing factors as to why they fell behind very specifically, along with the third factor, the jungle difference here. All right. Now, Ares isn't necessarily on paper, a bad jungler. In fact, in a lot of ways, he's a very scary and intimidating jungler. Again, as I mentioned earlier in this video, if Ares pops out of the jungle and lands his first chain on you, you're probably dead, and it's only through the coordinated effort of my team that that second gank, after I cleared that tower, didn't kill me, right? It is only through the extremely great work of the Ganesh, Big Big Rice, who kept me alive in that, that I was able to get out of that situation alive. Okay, but that was also a great demonstration of how Ares can be an incredibly scary jungler. The problem here is that Loki is very capable of traversing the jungle a little bit faster, because every time Loki is invisible, he also increases his movement speed by a surprisingly good amount. So using invisibility judiciously would allow the Loki to very effectively move a little bit faster through the jungle, and furthermore, he wouldn't need Blink to get a hot gank, because his ultimate teleports him, as you saw from that first gank on Anubis, teleports him right there, and from there, it's just a matter of dealing enough damage to finish the enemy off, so Loki has more consistent surprise initiation into a lane for a gank that Ares would need Blink for, so Ares, while he could gank without using Blink, he could simply walk into a lane, as you could see from his first two attempts at ganking my lane, this isn't really terribly, you know, effective, right? You can usually see him coming with even decent warding. Loki, however, can turn invisible, and you can't he see him coming if he ults into your lane to kill you, and again, the ult is going to be up a little bit more often than the Blink, so Loki has a mild advantage here in both movement speed and in gank ability, right, in ganking options, I should actually say, than Ares does. So these would lead Ares to having something of a problem in that particular regard. Furthermore, Ares has a bit of a harder time clearing jungle camps than Loki does, because his abilities aren't quite as consistent in their damage output. For example, when Ares is going to clear a jungle camp, he only has one ability that can do that, his flames. 
because his chain only hits a jungle camp once unless there's an enemy god in that camp to hit with a chain. But generally speaking, Ares only has the one ability that he can use to clear camps. And you can see where it took Ares three items to get even a little bit of cooldowns. Which means he had to basically wait to use his flame to clear a camp really quickly. Now, let me set up a hypothetical scenario here. Take Ares. Picture yourself as a jungle Ares for a minute. You pick Ares, you go into the jungle, you clear, and I don't care what level you're at, you can be whatever level you picture. You go to clear your speed. You use your flames to clear the speed because it's the speed buff and you need that, right? You want to clear that quick. Okay. Great. Clear the camp. Your flames are now on cooldown, right? So while you wait for your flames to be on cooldown, off you go to the two little harpies on the side. You clear those with your auto attacks and probably a random chain if you didn't use that on the speed buff. Okay. And then you go to the big harpies and then you clear that with the flame. So far, we're at a decent pace, right? Not bad. Not bad. Go to the blue buff. Clear that. Don't need the flames for that most of the time, but, you know, it's up to you. Then you go to the right jungle. Alright, now you clear the green. Or actually, more likely, you clear the red. You use your flames for that because it's the mid lane's red. It's pretty important. Okay, great. Now you go back and you try to clear the green. That travel time from the red buff to the green buff isn't so long that Ares' flame is going to be back online. Just isn't. So he's auto-attacking that hell of the green buff. Probably throws his chain on it if he didn't use his chain for the fire for the fire giant for the red buff right but either way he's primarily and predominantly auto attacking that right and then he you know rotates around and does whatever but there's that one moment and this could happen very consistently depending on how efficiently he's using his flame right how how well pathed he is if he makes a pathing mistake which, well, not even a pathing mistake, actually, I want to say. If he spends too much time in a lane trying to gank, then he's going to have his whole rhythm th thrown off here. And unfortunately for Ares, a throw-off of, of rhythm is going to really hurt his ability to clear a camp. Because, of course, he's going to use his flame in a gank attempt. And once that gank attempt either fails or succeeds, his flame is down and he's not going to be able to hop back into the jungle and immediately clear a camp. He's just not going to have that option anymore. Whereas Loki might not commit all of his abilities to killing a target, and so he would have an ability or two up to clear a camp right afterwards, right? So essentially the problem with Ares is besides the mild inefficiency inherent in his kit in terms of jungling, but we also have the problem of Ares, most likely in a majority of cases, having a really hard time jumping back into the jungle and immediately clearing a camp right afterwards, because a lot of the times that he does pull off a gank, he will have used his flame for that gank, and that will be offline when he goes for a camp right after that gank, right? Again, whether the gank succeeds or fails. So Ares has two uh, slowdown problems compared to Loki, and again, keep in mind, this doesn't even include the fact that an efficient gank for Ares involves Blink, and Loki doesn't need Blink for that, he's got his ult, right? <sighs> so these are really the reasons why Ares is a problematic jungler, and this is, you know, problematic for the enemy dual lane because they don't have any kind of uh, they don't really have a whole lot of opportunities here to gank at this particular point, because, of course, Ares is trying to keep up with Loki, and, obviously, Ares failed some ganks here and got killed a couple of times, so he was already falling behind at that point, stack on the other problems that I mentioned earlier, and he wasn't likely to try to pull off a gank on uh, Cheese Police, because Cheese Police, of course, is going to absolutely slap, and Cheese Police even respected the man lane by going into a third item, Chin Size, and the only other real option there was to go for Executioner instead. Executioner or Chin is totally your choice. Um, but, you know, either Executioner or Chin size great item as a third option against a man lane, and of course that would really hurt the tankier man lane in this particular instance, because it's Chin size, right? Absolutely slaps. So that is primarily, the combination of those reasons is why the jungle and the dual lane didn't really work out the mid lane the mid lane comes down to a range difference here all right both grossly outranges ishtar yes i know she's got the extendo shots but those take you know that that has a 
decently long cooldown, those cooldowns are a bit faster there. So while yes, she can occasionally match those range, Generally speaking, Thoth is busting out long-distance shots more frequently than Ishtar is, and so that's just a matter of poking out Ishtar until she eventually dies or gets ganked, which is what Loki was doing, right? So Thoth, all Thoth had to do was continuously pelt Ishtar with long-range shots that she was only able to return half the time, and then once she was low enough, Loki would come in for a gank, right? That's that issue. For the Anubis, I mentioned this earlier, Anubis is not necessarily a bad choice here. Ishtar isn't necessarily a bad choice for mid lane either. I've already covered why Ares is a mixed bag in terms of jungling, but the Anubis' problem was that he went for Warlock Staff first. I know a lot of people build Warlock Staff. I know the pros build Warlock Staff. But the reason why pros build Warlock Staff is because they can communicate with their jungler and say, hey, I need a gank so that way I can finish my stacks, right? And even then, I've said this for quite some time, I don't think Warlock Staff is worth building. Book of Thoth in some situations, sure, but I don't think you get enough stats out of Warlock's staff, in my opinion, to justify that and the amount of time it takes to stack that. I don't think it's a justified purchase. If Anubis had run right to even a tier... Uh, the ideal situation here for an Anubis in solo lane, and a lot of Anubis mains will likely agree with me here, is tier 2 to Bancrofts, right? That's 1,400 gold. Grab a couple of health potions, grab Locust Breath, and just really lean on that damage and lifesteal, because you're going to have the mana buff, and again, at levels 1 through 5, your abilities you're just getting, you're not, you know, spending huge amounts of mana there, so not having any form of MP5 is fine, you have your blue buff at the beginning, because that's a guaranteed blue buff at the start, unless you somehow get ganked, which is very rare right now, but nearly guaranteed blue buff at the start. Then you have, of course, you know, your damage and lifesteal from the Stage 2 Bancrofts and a little bit of a mana increase there. So you're, you're totally fine, at least for the first run, to not build any kind of serious MP5 or any MP5 at all. It's only when you return to lane, I'm sorry, return to fountain, that you might want to pick up the Hourglass, you might want to pick up some MP5, and then go back into Bancrofts, right? In this particular case, the Hourglass would have been just fine. You know, start with the Stage 2 Bancrofts, try to compete with Osiris in lane, because Anubis can with Stage 2 Bancrofts and Locust Breath, right? That's a pretty scary combo there. And then, you know, eventually when you as Anubis have to go back, you go back, you grab your Hourglass for the MP5, maybe you finish your Bancrofts and you run right back into lane, teleport back into lane, whatever, and then you go about having a normal self-healing day, right? The Anubis did not do this. The Anubis built Warlock Staff, and so for the early part of that game, I was able to bully him out of lane, and then from there, roll that into a nice mid-game lead that I was able to put to some good use in a couple of good team fights. All right, and some good tower clearing as well. Okay, that was really the problem there. Okay. Now, the only real thing I can criticize the enemy team for as a whole is the man lane. It doesn't, as this proves, it doesn't work as well as it used to long ago, and I know some people do it for the memes. Uh, the Hercules mentioned that they were, you know, they'd had a bunch of losses in a row, and they just wanted to have, you know, a fun game. They enjoyed the game, so I think mission accomplished there. And there's nothing wrong with that if you're going to get up and if you're feeling up in arms about, oh, no, he just wanted, it's a game. Smite is a game. We're supposed to have fun. If you're not having fun playing the game, play something else. Come back to it when you're going to enjoy it, right? If you're not enjoying it, don't play. So the Hercules was feeling down, wanted a fun Smite game, built a little meme, right? Built a little meme -y. Which is why, generally, I haven't been too uh, critical of the Hercules build. I will say that in regards to what the the information that Hercules was working with, Breastplate of Valor was actually a pretty good choice, even if, it, even if it was for the memes. I think Mystical Mail should have waited a little bit. I think that should have been some form of dual protections. Uh, Caduceus Shield there was basically just swap Caduceus Shield and Mystical Mail, and I think that would have been a much stronger build there. All right? Essentially. But other than that, not a terrible build. Shield of Regrowth is weak right now, but obviously that was built for the speed. And Caduceus Shield, of course, is just a really good item on anybody who has any form of healing, so that's fine. Good dual protections there. That would be the only thing I would say about the Hercules build. Again, the Ares build, nothing particularly wrong with it. It just took him too long to get some cooldowns. I also don't... Uh, I had the jungle wasn't that bad of a choice, actually, so I'm going to leave that one alone. 
Uh, but yeah, that's that is why they had such a they fell behind so quickly. It was a combination of little factors. A lot of them were factors inherent in the team comp issues. Again, Ares being the jungler versus Loki does have some issues that I mentioned. The way the Anubis built. Well, actually, let me rephrase that because it wasn't the way the Anubis built. Anubis's second item was a problem uh, for Anubis. The Ishtar's matchup was trash. Although honestly, most hunters are going to have a really rough time against those just because he outranges them, and that's, you know, predominantly what hunters want to do is be in range, right? Enemy mages don't have as much problem with those, depending on the mage, because at the very least, they have something that they can use to theoretically poke him. We've got Chain Lightning from Zeus, for instance. We have the Nuwa Fog, and potentially her minions. Um, Poseidon could speed up using his second ability and then bust out a... Uh, quick little whirlpool, and if the Thoth isn't paying attention, then he can't dash out, and then you, you know, cracking him, right? There's, it, depending on the matchup, Thoth can get really slapped down, it just so happens that most hunters don't have that capability because they're out of range enough, and even, again, even though the Ishtar can produce longer range shots, these aren't going to be up as often as Thoth's longer range shots, so she's only going to be able to return fire approximately 50% of the time, which, of course, isn't really what you want to see, right? But, it was a really interesting game, and, it, I, and I really did want to talk about this. So with that being said, thank you all very much for joining me, and if you liked this, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, please ignore me, and if you have any comments, questions, concerns, ideas, suggestions, or requests, please leave them down in the comment section below, and thank you all very much for joining me, and have a great 24 hours.